Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of John, and it's chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. You'll find that on page 79 in the New Testament in your pew Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, he, comes, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we pray, move us now with your Holy Spirit that we might hear and experience the wonder and joy of the living word as we seek to welcome the written word into our lives. In Christ's name, amen. So you might have heard <clears throat> when I announced that Bible study would start that we're going to do the book of John, and here we are starting in the book of John. So this ministry season, uh, we are going to pair our sermon series on Sundays with our Bible studies on Wednesdays. Often there are so many more things to a passage and to a chapter that I could possibly preach up here, and in fact, today is a great example. These first 18 verses of John, you could talk about for about three hours if you wanted to go in depth, and I could see all your eyes glaze over, and you'd be like, no, please no. So we're going to go short, <laughs> but then it gives this opportunity to continue the conversation in Bible study. And so this is kind of like a great opportunity and a great invitation then to come on Sundays, hear a passage, mark down what your questions are. Oh, oh, I would have liked Pastor Ann to go deeper over here. I don't understand this. And then come on Wednesday to go deeper into each passage. And so as I said, September 25th will be when we start the book of John in Bible study, and we'll start John 1. So I'm, we're going to move ahead a little. We're going to go faster in Sunday mornings, and then we're going to go slower in Bible study. So, so we start with John 1, and uh, we, I can go deeper when we hit, hit Bible study about this, but I should say 
that this fourth gospel, this gospel of John, is just a little different than the other three gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So Clement of Alexandria, who's this uh, early Christian theologian and philosopher, he wrote that the other gospels, the other evangelists, they wrote about bodily things, right? They wrote about bodily things, but John, being moved by the Holy Spirit, he wrote about spiritual gospel. He wrote a spiritual gospel. So John is sometimes called the theologian of the four gospel writers, whereas the other writers maybe wrote more of a historical picture of Jesus and his life and what happened. John wrote a gospel about what it all meant then. I think the other gospel writers, though, would maybe be a little upset if we uh, suggested, maybe they'd even feel insulted if we suggested that John was the only theologian and the rest of them were just historians um, and that they didn't have any spiritual matters as part of their gospels when they wrote it. Um, But the truth remains, there's still something different about John's gospel. So there is crossover, they're all theologians, John wrote some history about Jesus. The other three were theologians themselves and wrote some about spiritual matters, but there's still something different about John's gospel. When speaking of John, there's these well-known sayings um, that says that this book, <clears throat> this book is like a pool that is safe for a child to paddle in, but deep enough for an elephant to swim in. So you can stay in the short end of the book of John or you go deep in like an elephant and go deeper. So uh, the good thing is there's different levels of John and you get to decide how deep you're going to go. So we'll probably stay more in pool area, maybe medium when we're preaching on Sunday morning and we'll start becoming elephants in Bible study. So if you want to be an elephant, come to Bible study. But John uses different vocabulary. He's trying to get some really big ideas out there. The main one, that Jesus is the Son of God. Everything that Jesus did was something that God did because Jesus is God. And it's his resurrection that cements that reality for us. That is one of John's biggest ideas that we kind of need to know right up front. So this new language, this new language, this big idea is there present from the very beginning of the book of John. These first 18 verses of John are called the prologue. And I imagine that they sounded very familiar when you heard them, when Jean read them, because we hear this passage typically preached around Christmas, right? It's either at Christmas Eve services or somewhere around the Christmas time, or it's always kind of folded in around Christmas. Um, So bear with me. They're going to be so sad, the people that didn't show up today, because we're going to do something weird and odd, and right now we're going to sing a couple Christmas hymns to put us in the mood, right? So I have have my people all set up. If you want to turn to 146 to get started, and I'm just going to warn you that we're going to sing, we're not going to sing all verses on any of these songs, so we're only singing the first and the fourth on Joy to the World. So I'm moving on. So stand if you'd like. <laughs>
57, verses 2 and 3. like you're in Christmas? <laughs> yeah. I was in Hobby Lobby yesterday uh, and they already had their Christmas trees up and ornaments up and like everything and I'm so I'm not trying to push the Christmas season up early. That's not what I'm doing here but uh, I've heard it suggested that there is no other season within the church that the music, the hymns used for it are so vital to celebrate and worship God in that season than Christmas time. And I might lean towards agreeing with that, at least in the Western culture of Christianity. Imagine coming to worship in December and January and never once singing joy to the world. Imagine our candlelit Christmas Eve service ending with any other song than Silent Night. These songs are vital to our faith and to our worship and our celebration of Christmas time and God becoming incarnate, Emmanuel. These hymns have become so tied to our worship of God during Christmas, and it's not a bad thing. I don't know if you were able to notice in our like whirlwind Christmas moment there, but if you go back at any time and look at those hymns and read the verses that I picked, it leans really hard into our passage of John today. Lots of God dwelling with us language in those verses. Lots of life and light language in those verses grace and truth language in those verses. These hymns are actually theologically rich with the truth of the gospel. I'm going to wade just a 
just a tad, just a toe into the worship wars, which is really brave of me to do because it's so late that I'm not really saying anything controversial in any way at, at any point. But the worship wars, remember, are just contemporary worship songs versus hymns. And, and churches deciding, are we going to stick with hymns? Are we going to go contemporary worship? And, and I'm here to land solidly in the middle that we can't get rid of both, and we have to do both. We can't get rid of hymns. They are theologically rich, and they sit in scripture, and they shape us, and they form us. And we can't get rid of contemporary music because <clears throat> they move in ways that uh, bring us to heights and emotion of remembering of our love for God and God's love for us. We're called to worship God with our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength, and we can't afford to lose either one because you need both of them. You need the hymns for your mind and your strength, and you need the contemporary music for your heart and your soul. <laughs> and not that they can't cross over, and they do, but, but we need both. And so we're going to sit in both, and we're going to continue to do contemporary music and we're going to continue to do hymns because they are beautiful and rich and they grow us, both of them, and we need both. So, shocking, um, anything that I just said there, right? <laughs> so, but, so as much, though, as these Christmas hymns are so tied to the worship of God and vital to bringing the fullness of celebration of the church, this prologue of John is in the same way vital to the rest of the book. As much as these hymns that we need at Christmas time that bring us kind of into that theological mindset and, and emotional mindset, because you sing them and you kind of already feel like you're in Christmas, right? And that's just natural. The prologue of John does the same thing for the rest of the book of John. It's like a hymn. It's beautiful, it's poetic, it's rich in theology, and, in, and it helps us understand then who Jesus is as we, we start out with that for the rest of the book. The one thing, though, that I do think I get wrong, that we all get wrong, and I pushed into it a little bit on purpose, is that I'm not so sure John, John was going for this, but the fact that we only really use John 1 around Christmas time. I don't think John was going for that. It speaks about Christ's birth, yes, but it isn't just about that. It's so much more. John's not really telling the classic Christmas story in his version of, in the beginning of his gospel. He's not so much explaining what happened, right, with uh, Mary and um, shepherds and angels. Instead, he's trying to tell us who God is, what kind of character God has, and why God would come to dwell with humanity. John is brilliant in that he patterns the beginning of this prologue like the very beginning of the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. John begins his gospel with the same three words as Genesis 1, in the beginning. In the beginning. There's no accident that John does this. He wants us to be thinking back to the story of creation. He wants us to have the long view of scripture. This is about a beginning new. This is, this is about a beginning that John's writing about, something new, and yet very familiar. Something very familiar is happening. John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Jesus, this human being that was born in Bethlehem, was not just some special, random human baby. It's not just that he grew up to be an adult and, and was a great teacher, or that he was wise and powerful and spoke powerfully in all the things that he did, which is true. No, John is trying to make the connection that Jesus was God himself. Jesus not, does not just pop up for the first time in the New Testament. He's not a new character here. 
that Jesus as the word has been forever been present and was there in the beginning as the vehicle to how God created all things. This is John saying, Jesus is God's son. Jesus is God. And there's only one God. And everything that God was doing from the very beginning, all the way back to Genesis. Right now, it's reaching its fulfillment in Jesus. This is the plan coming into fulfillment. John tells us that in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. That the light, it shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. This also should draw us back to Genesis. In much the same way in Genesis that God spoke life and light into a world filled with nothingness and chaos and darkness. Jesus in the incarnation came into the world to bring life and to be light to a dark world that desperately needed God. Jesus is God renewing and rebirthing and recreating all that he did in Genesis, but now in the person of Jesus Christ. He's saying again these words, let there be light. And he is there, present then in the world as light. This continues to be a part of God's character then throughout scripture, one who is always creating, one who is light and life and continues to speak words of light and truth so that he can continue to be one who brings life to this whole world. This reality, it tells us that if Jesus is God and has been God from the very beginning, then Jesus, as the word, as part of the Godhead, has cared for humanity as he took part in creating humanity in the stories of Genesis. He has lamented when humanity has chosen to be disobedient towards God. He has created ways like through the covenant with Abraham or Moses to draw humanity back to God, to bless this world and tell the world that God loves them. And he has refused to abandon the people of God. He has continued to offer them promises of hope and a future. Jesus, as part of the Godhead, has been a part of these movements of God towards humanity and therefore now comes to fulfill all of God's promises that have been present throughout the Old Testament. How does this happen then? John tells us it's through the word becoming flesh. John 1, 14 tells us, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. A lot of us like Eugene Peterson's translation there, though, that God moved into the neighborhood. God moved into the neighborhood. He, God accomplishes this by coming as God's self and living with us as our next door neighbors. God was the sovereign God of the universe, and his coming to earth was a miracle and a wonder unlike anything the world had ever seen before. But why would God choose to do this? And John has been leading up to this throughout the whole passage. In verse 9, he says that the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who would receive him, to those who would believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Not children born of our parents, but children born of God. This beginning of John is all about the amazing and the radical hope and grace of that invitation to become part of God's family. The world, it says, keeps pretending to not know God, keeps pretending to not need God, and we still see that today. And yet that couldn't be farther from the truth 
when we turn on our TVs, when we watch the news, listen to the radio, interact with our family and friends, we know this world needs God. And instead of letting the world be consumed by that darkness, God sent Jesus, who cannot be consumed by darkness, who is light and life itself as God. So God continues to offer then grace upon grace to us, continues to faithfully love us. God did not just move into the neighborhood. God moved in and he he put out a big welcome sign on front of his house and said, not only am I your neighbor, but come live with me in my house. You don't even need your house anymore. Come live with me in my house. Be part of my family. This is who God is, John says. This is what word made flesh is all about. That word, word. (laughs) When we speak, we use words, right? We use words and they reflect what we say, they reflect who we are. When our actions don't match what we say, people start calling us out, right? Kids, teenagers are really good at doing that with teachers, parents, confirmation teachers, pastors, <laughs> anybody, right? Uh, toddlers are really good at doing that. If, if they've been told something that they've been promised and you haven't been following up on that. I know uh, when my nephews were really young, they had minds like traps and they could remember everything that you told them. And if you didn't do it, oh my goodness, you were going to get it talking to by a three-year-old. <laughs> so, but, right, our words show who we are, and our words need to match up. And, and when we don't, when we make it, you know, it says, hey, but you said this. You're not following through on your word, right? And words matter. We make handshake deals on words and say, I'm going to keep you to your word, right? In Jesus being the word made flesh, God is showing us his willingness to be held to his word, held to his promises, held to his character. God's showing us that what he says and what he does are the same and will always be the same. Jesus coming into the world, Jesus' very life matched his identity as the word. His life was one of light and of life. His life was one of grace and truth. His life was one of healing and forgiveness. His life was one of hope and love. What happens after Jesus was made flesh, what is written about in the rest of the gospel is the story of Jesus's life-giving, life-saving work as our Savior and Lord. God keeping his word, fulfilling his promises, loving us so much that he came in the flesh to show us the way to him so that we may not get lost in the dark, but instead become children of God, living in his house, being welcomed in, with all the rooms and all our brothers and sisters in Christ. The prologue then is an invitation. It's an invitation to come and meet Jesus. Come, come and see who this is. Come, come and be a child of God and receive grace upon grace. As we continue in this book of John, It will continually be an invitation to come to Bible study, right? Come and hear more of what John is doing when he's identifying Jesus as grace and truth. Come and hear more about how John is using the Old Testament, things that I can't go fully into here because we don't have three hours. I mean, we do, but you'd all leave. But 
but it's also an invitation to come back next week, right? Come hear more of the story. Come and hear what it means to follow Jesus and be part of his family. Let us pray. Mighty and everlasting God, we thank you that you are Emmanuel, God with us, and that you came so unexpectedly but faithfully to dwell with us in a world in in desperate need of your love, your hope, your grace, your truth. May your light shine in each of our lives, and, and may we make sure we open our hearts and make room for you with all of who we are and join your family. Lord, we pray receive the offering of our life, our time, our labor, and Lord, feed us with that grace upon grace. We pray this prayer along with the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.